Erev Tov in Katamon. Good morning in Tulsa. Greetings, everybody. My name's Wayne Firestone. It is wonderful to be back with you midweek. Yes, we have moved our series with Gabriel, Gabriella to uh, midweek on Wednesday. So hump day gets to be really exciting and something you're looking forward to. Gabriella, great to be back with you. Before we start our conversation and meet some great new artists, I want to remind everyone that today, May 24th, is Brothers Day here in at least the United States. I don't know if that's celebrated anywhere else. I thought that might be a nice opportunity to share a little love with the brothers out there, whether that's a biological brother or a brother by another mother or just a bro in your life who you want to give uh, send some love to today. So if you do, if you got a brother you want to honor today, put them in the chat and uh, it's like sending them, you know, uh, some artwork for Brother's Day is what we're going to do with this episode. Happy to hear about um, all of the people who are uh, with us today. Let us know where you're uh, calling in from, where you're checking in from uh, during our live episode. And uh, we've got a great program for you today. I really enjoyed uh, our uh, earlier prep call with Gabriella about uh, the three different artists we're featuring. And we were toying around with what the uh, right connection point would be for three very, very different artists. Uh, and what we came up with was to focus a little on the motivation of artists and look at how um, something that you get to see in the gallery or as a, a final product, you know, sort of what the artist is thinking along the way of their journey, what might motivate them and inspire them to create a piece. And Gabriella, I'm looking at all those books behind you today, which is not normally your background. It, 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 it makes me curious because I uh, often get ideas for some of my clay writing material from reading uh, uh, children's stories or or old um, you know myths and and uh, that aren't actually visual, but then sort of start thinking about them, how to adapt them onto this stage. So I'm 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 curious since last week we got the pleasure of seeing some of your own work uh, and you talk so beautifully about motherhood and and how that you incorporated that into a lot of your work i'm i'm curious about what other motivations in your work and whether uh you know stories and things like that also inspire some of your 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 uh, creations oh absolutely i mean um i mean we are we are readers in the family we actually have a we have a bookstore in the family my um my husband's grandparents started uh the joseph fox bookstore in philadelphia over 50 wow. years ago um, so we have many of these walls in our house that are full of books. Um, and yeah, I read, I read a lot of fiction. Um, I look at other artists' work. Um, I read, we're, we're, we're all voracious readers. So yeah, that's definitely one of the inspirations. And one of the things I'm going to showcase today, like you said, is like some artists really look inwards some artists look at their own biography for the inspiration and the motivation for making their work some of them are very cerebral and have um, almost a like conceptual reasons for making their work some look at other artists in other periods so that's really what we're gonna we're gonna focus on three super different artists but I think very very interesting looking forward to it so why don't we go ahead and and uh, uh, start our our virtual tour and and um, see where these three different artists find their motivations and 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 how they culminate in in such outstanding work that you get to show us wonderful so before before i jump in i'll just tell you if you look at the very top of the chat i put in the names of the artists and the exhibitions that we're uh, going to see today uh, if anyone want to do wants to do further googling or looking up these are this is how you um, spell all the names and all the venues uh, so that's up there and uh, and also any questions you may have uh, please put them in the chat i'm not going to look at the chat while i'm talking to not interrupt uh, but wayne will be looking at it and i'll be taking questions at the end so it can be about any of the shows we can kind of revisit pop up a new um an image that we looked at before so 
Uh, any questions that come up, please just put them in there. So okay. I'll, I'll just say out loud, Elizabeth Clay, Saul Lewitt, and Jordan Nasser. Uh, and as Gabriella said, if, if uh, we, we highly encourage you after these introductions is to, to um, delve deeper and learn more about the artists, take a look at their website, see where they have shows, because uh, there's nothing that will ultimately replace uh, live art and, and yeah. seeing uh, these people in person. This, we hope, will be a great uh, introduction for all of you. Absolutely. Okay. So, <clears throat> there we go. So we're starting from an exhibition at a gallery in Tribeca uh, in New York uh, that just closed literally two days ago um, of the artist Elizabeth Clay. And the name of the gallery is Canada Gallery, like the country, only they have nothing to do with Canada. They just chose that as their name. Um, and uh, here's, I brought you a picture of Elizabeth. Uh, here she is, she's in her early 60s. Um, as you see here, she works both in textile, which is what we can see here. And in the show, we see her textile work. We see her sculpture work. Those, those things on the pedestals and on the floor are actually ceramic sculptures, which we'll um, look at in more detail in a moment. And, and uh, she also paints on the wall, so creates these kinds of installations. Um, and I want to give you a quick uh, kind of look at the show. And but before we do that, I want to sh share a video of Elizabeth in her studio because I often feel, first of all, this is the advantage of doing Zoom lectures and doing online lectures is that, yes, I can't take you to the gallery and we can't look at the work in person, but the Zoom lectures allow me to bring you interviews with the artists and you can see them in their studio and you can see them talking about their work and handling their work and uh, making it. And I feel like that's worth so many words. So here are two and a half minutes with Elizabeth Clay in her studio. And later we'll kind of dive into her work and I'll talk more about the process um, aspects that we see in the video and, um, and everything else. So here's two and a half minutes with Elizabeth Clay. When I started making ceramics, I was definitely painting, but then I just felt like painting had too much baggage. I just wanted to do th things that were frivolous and light and not weighty. I thought, well, I can make paintings on ceramics, you know. And so I gave up painting and I had nice little drawings and then now look at me. All this stuff <laughs> takes up a lot of space and it's heavy, but you know, still, I feel looser about it. Right now, I'm completely inspired by Egypt. I love that evolution of art, like evolution and transformation. Motifs just get transformed and played with, and I love that, and I like to be a part of it. I'll start by looking at pictures I have and doing smaller drawings, and then I will enlarge them or change them to fit on the ceramic pieces. And then I think up a ceramic shape, and then I fit something on it. I like the idea that, you know, if you felt like it, you could put flowers in it. I was working in color till about 2014, but I had always made detailed black and white drawings. And then I just started doing the black and white ceramics and it took over black against white and white against black, you know, with the reversal and, and playing with that. What's black and what's white? 
you know, what's positive, what's negative. But basically, I think artists should do whatever they want. So those were two minutes with um, Elizabeth Clay. So the first thing she tells us about herself in that video is that she used to be a painter and then she gave it up and became a sculptor. And of course we see that she also continued to be a painter in many, many ways. But the thing that she did make some, create some distance with is color. Although uh, she just had a museum show in which more work like the work that I showed you in that, uh, in this image, the color is returning. Uh, that video is from a year ago, so things changed. But in this show at Canada, what I love about this show is we can really see just how we saw in her studio, we, see, we saw her um, ink drawings on the wall, and then we saw the same designs on the sculptures, and then we saw her drawing her designs on the sculptures. You can see in the show as well how this is an artist who really, it's all about line, it's all about shape, it's all about pattern. And sometimes it takes on three-dimensional shapes. Sometimes it's on the wall. Sometimes it's on a fabric. But this thing of connecting a shape, a three-dimensional shape with a design is something that's very inspiring to her. And she also is a very modular, she works in a modular way. So we'll see in a moment how she puts things together. Now in the video you saw, she talked about ancient Egypt being a point of reference. And um, she, she showed some uh, kind of frond-like motifs that are really kind of lifted from ancient um, Egyptian uh, design motifs really. But another uh, source of inspiration that she doesn't talk about in that video, but she's talked extensively about in other interviews is um, this uh, the Viennese workshop. It's, it was a kind of a collective of artists and designers that, as you can see, existed between 1903 and 1932 in Vienna, and was a collective of many different people, many of them uh, Jewish, by the way. And they did fabric design, like you can see here, a lot of pattern design that was either fabric or wallpaper. They did a lot of um, a lot of uh, Shana Tova greeting cards. Um, and this is one of those institutions that really flourished in Europe um, before the world wars and between them as well, that um, created this kind of graphic design, what we think of today as these kind of classical motifs or modernist motifs, they really handmade those things, hand drew those lines, those colors, those shapes. They did a lot of furniture design. So you see how for them also line and form were very, very important. And this is from a design standpoint, whether it's furniture or fabric or, um, or postcard design. And you can really see the inspiration that um, Clay takes from, from this place. Um, this is what I was talking about with the modularity of her work. As you can see, this is a sculpture that's on the ground. It's made from many different pieces. They are all, by the way, terracotta, like that kind of reddish brown clay that you saw that she paints and glazes over with black and white glazes. And she makes these kinds of boxes or these shapes that have the half circles on them. And then she stacks them. So first she'll do a lot of drawing on paper, making all those designs, finding all these motifs that she likes. Then she'll make a bunch of shapes in clay. Then she'll see, okay, which design works with which shape. And finally, she'll construct her sculpture from modularly from these different pieces. And once they're in the exhibition, then they're settled, that is their shape, that is what they look like. Another room in the exhibition is really informative. It's a, kind of a small room, a project space in the gallery that shows her drawings on paper, not the same drawings that we saw in the video, but these are actually the drawings that she made when she was planning this exhibition that we're looking at. 
So those two columns that you see drawn in the space are the two architectural columns that are in the gallery. And she just made a bunch of drawings. Here I have a picture showing you the, these columns. So you can see they came back. And she just made a bunch of drawings kind of dreaming up her show. So this is really a person who thinks in drawings, thinks in lines. Uh, she was thinking both about what she was gonna paint on the walls and which sculptures were gonna be where. Some of her plans included designs on the floor that would create kind of more of a maze. And you can see in this version that she dreamed up but never executed, um, the drawings on the, the wall drawings really show kind of a, a garden with flowering trees. In another one, there's more of a staircase motif, but it kind of goes everywhere and there's little staircases and big staircases. What she ended up deciding on is a much more minimalist version of what we just saw. She did keep that kind of staircase design. And you can see, I think it's possible to see in these images that her line, you can see is very handmade. This was not made with a ruler. This was not made with masking tape. This was kind of hand drawn right on the wall with uh, paint dripping and uh, it's messy and it's handmade. This is all of course on purpose and part of her language because one of the things that's really interesting for Elizabeth Clay is to make work that's both extremely striking and, um, and graphic but also very, very handmade. And you feel the hand in everything that she makes. So just like she makes drawings to um, plan out her exhibitions, she makes drawings to decide how to arrange her modular sculptures. So she will draw different cubes and different shapes and different configurations and kind of dream, dream about it on paper until she gets to the form that she likes. And here's one of her sculptures. And she talked in the video a little bit about how she has all these patterns and then she looks around the studio and finds the sculpture that the patterns will go on. And that, that sculpture will get those patterns. And you really see how for her, it kind of doesn't matter if she's working in 2D or in 3D, it's all the same world. And there is something I think both very much kind of makes you think of um, uh, ancient Egypt and those kind of designs that they had on their sarcophagus and on the papyrus and on the vestments that we found, but also very much kind of a modernist style. And when I say modernism, by the way, um, we are today in an era that we think of as the postmodernist era. Modernism depends on which scholar you ask and uh, what exactly they wrote their PhD on. But modernism, a lot of people say, started with the invention of, of photography in the 1850s and lasted until some people say uh, World War II, um, some people say a little later. So it's a chunk of time of 100 years, more or less, between the mid 1800s and the mid 1900s. And that's what we think of as the modernist era. Here's one more um, fabric work. These are not stretched canvases. They're kind of hang loosely um, like tapestries on the wall. And she really thinks always she's in that she's in that in between era area between art and craft, right? Between design and art. She makes her paintings, but they, she hangs them like tapestries. She makes sculptures, but sometimes she puts um, a plant in them as if they were planters. This is an artist who also works a lot between those worlds of art and craft. Uh, and for her, I don't think that she feels like she needs to say, well, I'm an artist, so I don't make tapestries. I'm an artist, so I make sculptures and not vases. For her, it's all, it's all the same and they're all equally good. And keep that thought in your head because the last exhibition we're going to see today comes from an artist who also really prizes that 
unique relationship between art and craft, between um, art and design, but from a very, very different angle. So this is Elizabeth Clay at Canada Gallery. And the next show I wanna show you, something quite different, is um, the artist Saul Lewitt's show at um, Paula Cooper Gallery in New York. So Saul Lewitt is no longer with us, but here he is, I brought you a picture of him. He died in 2008. And um, Saul Lewitt was a pioneer of what we today think of as conceptual art. And here's his exhibition again. Before I tell you about him, I wanna tell you about this gallery that the show is in because this gallery is a very unique institution in New York. So Paula Cooper Gallery, and here is Paula Cooper herself, is a gallery that just celebrated its 50th anniversary and has been run by Paula Cooper uh, for those 50 years. It is now run as a family business between her and her sons and uh, a few partners. Here's, uh, here's Paula Cooper in the 70s in her uh, gallery in Soho. And what she pioneered is this whole group of artists that we think of as conceptual artists. So from the 70s and 80s, and a little bit late 60s. So if anyone here has ever, ever visited the Dia Beacon um, Museum in upstate New York, and you've seen things like artworks that are made of fluorescent lights, for example, just a few fluorescent lights by Dan Flavin, or if you've seen these Solowitz drawings on the wall, or if you've seen Carl Andre who arranged um, uh, railroad tracks on the floor in small increments, these are Paula Cooper's people. And what Paula, Paula Cooper did is in the 70s, she not only discovered these artists who were making a new kind of art, but she also championed them, gave them exhibitions and created a market for their work. So she was also actually able to sell some of this very strange, enigmatic kind of work that didn't e even look like art to many people. And by creating a market for it and showcasing it, she basically created a movement in American art, what we think of as minimalism. So before we dive into this exhibition of Solowitz's work, I want to show you some of the earlier stuff that he was known for. So for example, this is one of his sculptures. He um, he thought a lot of his artworks in terms of almost like a mathematician, almost like equations. He said, okay, I want to make a sculpture that's a grid of many different, um, of a certain number of squares. And so he built this sculpture. It's handmade from wood, but it looks like it came out of a factory. It doesn't look like an artist made it. It doesn't look like an artwork. Then he started a series of sculptures that every time had a different number of three-dimensional uh, cubes or flatter squares, like what you see hanging on the wall. And then he would take this kind of idea of the grid of the square that in three dimensions turns into a cube and just made a whole series of, of work kind of speculating on all the different variations. So. He's almost more of a mathematician than a sculptor here. So he was making a lot of this kind of work. And he was always making these drawings to plan out his work or to create instructions for his work. And then one day before he was about to show a piece at um, a show, a whole exhibition of his work at um, Paula's gallery, he told her, you know what, I've decided something. I've decided that my art is really the concept. It's the idea. It's not about me making it because clearly his work is not about the craft or the, and the hand of the artist, it's about the idea. And he began making what you're seeing here. This is a plan for an artwork. It's called, it's a diagram. It's a wall drawing number 1237, 1237. And it shows how between two windows, 
a piece of um, um, drywall basically needs to be erected. And then it should be drawn on with a pencil, creating shades of gray. You can read here the instructions. Shades of gray with progressively more pencil scribbles, whereas six, which is on the two edges, are numbered six. That is the maximum density of pencil scribble. And he told her, you know what, as an artist, I've decided I'm not going to make my art anymore. I'm going to make the concept for this art. I'm going to create the instructions, which will sometimes be very, very specific, like here, and sometimes less specific, and someone else is going to make it. And here is the finished artwork, by the way. This is a real wall drawing that was made. I'm going to show you up, up close what these markings look like. So they're really kind of abstract scribbles to just get lighter and denser and with that create a lighter or darker shade. These are all close ups of this work. And why did he decide to do this? It's not because he had a ton of money to pay assistance because he didn't in the beginning. It's not because he didn't feel like making the work. He wasn't lazy. He actually worked in a studio every day um, from nine to five uh, for his entire life. Um, no, the reason was that he decided, I want to see what can you make an artwork and take out of the equation of making art the hand of the artist, the genius so-called of the artist. What if the artist is the one who comes up with the concept and then it doesn't matter who makes it? And this leads us to um, an exhibition that you can actually visit still. Mass Mocha is a beautiful museum in um, North Adams in Massachusetts near Williams College. And Mass Mocha has a whole section of its building that is basically a retrospective of Solowitz's work. So as you can see, he worked in color, he worked in black and white. These are all drawings that were made on the walls by Solowitz instructions um, after he had already uh, passed away. They were created by the people who work in his studio. <clears throat> Excuse me, a lot of the people who have worked in his studio have worked there for decades, worked there while the artist was alive. Some are also new hires and it and continues as an estate and, a, and as a foundation. So some works like this one, the instruction is um, create a non-straight vertical, non-straight, non-touching lines from floor to ceiling. And this is what the person made. So before we move on to the exhibition at Paula Cooper Gallery in New York, I brought you another little video of the process of actually creating this exhibition at Mass Mocha. Because like I like to show you artists in their studios, here we don't have any footage of Solowit making this work because he didn't make it. But um, the museum made a beautiful little documentary of the people making his installation. So it's almost three minutes. Um, there's just background sound, no one's talking. But just for you to see all the different methods that they use to make his work, you're going to see people using paint washes, ink, um, drawing with pencil, with paint brushes. You're going to see all kinds of tools being used to create the lines. This is all according to the artist's instructions. OK, so here are three minutes at Solowitz show in Mass Mocha, Massachusetts. <laughs> Thank you. 
just a little uh, a little taste and uh, the thing i wanted to draw your attention to is this little section um where we saw this, this is actually was done with um collaboration with williams college students so you see how they're painting the wall with these ink washes using rags and they make these kind of motions circular or padding motions with their hands this is how they're applying the pigment to the wall. And I just want you to remember that because this is very important for the show that we're gonna see. And then they peel off the paper or the, um, or the masking tape that they use to create the fine edges. So keep that in mind. And now we're back at Paula Cooper Gallery. So this exhibition already ended and you know when uh, Soloit exhibitions come are installed. That means that someone comes to the space and paints these things directly on the wall. And when the show comes off the walls, it's actually just painted over. So um, I brought you something to illustrate that. I took a picture of the corner of one of the walls just so you see, this is literally paint applied to the actual wall to create these designs. And when the show is over, that means that people come there with buckets of white paint and they paint over the exhibition. And this is totally on purpose, right? So for Solowit, one of the reasons that he made wall paintings and wall drawings and not just drawings and paintings on things that you can move around was again, him taking something out of the equation. Can you make art without creating permanent art objects? Can you make an artwork that changes every time you install it, you hang it in a space because every time it's made for that specific wall and for that specific place. So he's making art, but he's, he's taking out the art object, the hand of the artist. He's leaving the concept, the idea, the collaborative aspect of working in a studio together, but he's taking out a lot of things that until that moment were considered crucial to the existence of an artwork. So for this, um, for these works, I'm gonna talk about the works on the wall, but also about the sculptures. These are also his, his works. You can see that by the time he's making this work, he's thinking a lot about color. These are all works from the 70s and 80s that he came up with in, sorry, 80s and uh, almost 90s that he came up with in that decade. This is after he lived in Siena in Italy for a few years and was very influenced by the colors of that, um, of the murals there, of the artwork there, of the nature there. These are kind of nicknamed the pyramid paintings because they're all kind of pointy but they're, they're abstract works. And the instructions for making them always had to do with how many angles to start from, what, uh, what um, height on the wall to begin from. And then the shades are created, let's get closer. He has a, a red, blue, and yellow. The, those are kind of the basic palette. And then the browns, and you can see how they're painted right on the wall. They're kind of saturated into the wall with the, with the rags. And the browns are created by layering uh, blue, yellow, and red in different, um, in different quantities. So there were even recipes for how to, which shade uh, to go to and how to reach it with these uh, three colors. So I'm just bringing you a few details so you get a kind of a feel of how this thing was painted on the wall. And you really see it's not a mixed color, it's really layers of some blue, some red, some yellow, and they're layered on top of each other to create the illusion of a, of a brown, kind of a purplish brown. So with these um, murals are these sculptures and the way that he made these sculptures um, is he would uh, take a piece of cardboard or paper and cut out of it a, a flat shape, a diamond shape or any kind of um, 
trapeze or a cross. And then all he would do is he would indicate, okay, here is the base, the shape that he had cut out is the base of the form. And then he would say, and now uh, make all these lines converge at six feet or at seven feet, at four feet tall. So however he indicated the height, that would indicate the kind of um, angle of the pyramids or structures that kind of emerge from these shapes. So this is someone who's very much thinking about 2D and 3D again, and how uh, a two-dimensional work can become three-dimensional if you stretch it out into, into space. And this is, the, um, this is the room next door. You can see a little bit of the street outside. It's a beautifully um, lit gallery as well. These are more versions of these pyramid um, works from the, from the 80s. Uh, these were made with ink washes. So that's where that kind of grayish uh, palette comes from. And again, just like the other ones, they were just painted over when the show was over. Here's the entire, uh, the entire room. So you can see how they're kind of inverted. Uh, the two pyramids, one is dark in the center and becomes light at the edges and the other one is uh, the inverse. So this is Solowit. This show you can no longer see at um, Paul Cooper. It is buried under many layers of paint already, but his Mass Mocha show is open and will be open for a few more years. So if you're planning a trip to Massachusetts, um, I really, really recommend that museum in general and that section of it in particular. Okay. And the last artist I wanted to share with you is, um, is this artist. This is uh, Jordan Nassar's work at James Cohan Gallery. We're back in Tribeca. Um, these are, I just wanted you to first see kind of the scale of his work. And here is Jordan himself um, in his studio. He is 38, I believe. Um, he lives in Brooklyn. Uh, he is um, American born. He was born in New York to a Polish mother and a Palestinian father. His father was from, uh, was born in Jordan. Uh, and is Palestinian Jordanian and moved to the States and uh, where he had his family. And his father um, is a doctor and has spent his whole uh, medical career doing humanitarian medical work in, um, in Gaza and the, and the territories in Palestine. And so Jordan grew up, while well, Jordan grew up completely here in the States, he has traveled a lot to um, Israel and Palestine, both with his father as a younger child. And now he also travels there with his partner. So this is all relevant to understand the motivation behind his work. Jordan is married to a Jewish Israeli man and they have uh, just had a baby together, Mazal Tov. And um, they, so when Jordan goes to Israel, he both goes to visit his um, husband's parents in Falsaba and do Shabbat with them. And he also travels to Palestine um, in the past years to create his uh, work. So all that to say is that this is a person who has been living the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from the very specific American-Palestinian diasporic uh, angle his whole life. He's living in this triangle between Israel, Palestine, and the U.S. It's very personal to him. It's his father. It's his family. It's his son. It's his husband. And this is where the work comes from. So before we dive into the work, I want to show you a little video with Jordan talking about his work and how he makes it and how he sources it, and then we'll keep going. So this is a minute and a half 
with Jordan Nasser in his studio, and you'll also get to see him making his work in a way. Okay, here he is. I did a residency in Tel Aviv almost a year ago now. And during that residency, I went to the West Bank and visited with a lot of different women's groups in refugee camps or small businesses started by women that work with the traditional Palestinian embroidery. And while I was there, I met a few women and bought some pillows and stuff from them that they had made. So for freeze, I took the pillows that I bought and I've made a body of work using the patterns that these women invented. But then using the colors, I make them into figurative landscapes in a way. I kind of conceptualized it in a way where the landscapes became representational of a Palestine that only really exists in the minds of diaspora Palestinians that isn't a real place. Like it's this utopia that is dreamed up by people who can't go there and see the reality. My goal with working with textiles is to kind of treat them as a medium to make work about other stuff, like not always make work about textile themselves. There is some poetry to using landscapes, considering it's work with, about Palestine that is about land and is about this place. So that's Jordan Nassar in his studio. He was talking about a um, series of work he had made for Freeze the Art Fair, but this is all relevant for the work that he um, continues to make today. So. As you heard, these are all embroidered panels of fabric. So each of these larger works are made of, in this case, 16 panels of fabric on which there is embroidery. Some of the embroidery is made by other people. So Nassar travels a lot, both in the West Bank and in Jerusalem and in Gaza and wherever he can find women who have traditionally worked in this embroidery method. And specifically, I want to um, uh, zoom in a little bit here. You can see uh, this is called um, cross embroidery or X embroidery. It's a, it's a type of embroidery where the building blocks are very simple X's or crosses, but at, as you can see, create amazingly intricate and accurate um, uh, designs, graphic-like graphic designs. And so the panels that are embroidered by the women who he commissions to make these works are the ones with the more traditional patterns on them. And there, all he tells them is he gives them the panel, right? Because he, he needs them all to fit together. He gives them the panel, the fabric. He gives them the, um, the colors that he would like them to use. And then he just gives them carte blanche. He says, as long as you stay within these borders, make the embroidery that you usually make, because um, the, as he was saying, these um, women mostly are taught matrilineally, so the same kind of stitches go uh, down in um, in the generations, and and grandmothers teach mothers who teach daughters how to make a certain design, uh, certain shapes, and that's what's in the family. That's what they embroider on their shirts and on their dresses and on their um, uh, upholstery. And then the panels, he takes these panels from these women and combines them with panels that he embroiders himself. And there's four of them here. I'm sure you can pick them out, the ones that, are, that look very different. And these four panels that he embroidered himself using as inspiration the designs that these women made usually depict a hillside or a mountain. What Nasser refers to as the rolling hills of Palestine. And it's not an accident that he uses this kind of poetic language. You've heard he said in the video, what, what he is working with is this kind of utopic vision of Palestine as can only be in the minds of those who are in the diaspora, who don't live there, who don't live in that um, reality and who more think of it as kind of a promised land. And so he creates visions of these places, of this fantasy. So of course this work is deeply political. It talks about a place and a time 
that we all know is extremely controversial, um, is extremely dynamic and changing every day. But it's also very, very personal. This is not a person who is just coming from the outside to comment on some situation he doesn't know anything about. On one hand, he doesn't live in Israel or in Palestine. He lives in New York. But he also knows something about what it means to have kind of a homeland that you've never been to as part of your emotional makeup. And that's what his work is about. Now there are two parts to this show. Once you exit the room with all the beautiful embroidery work on it, you enter an installation that artists created. This is a continuation of a museum show he had in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, for those of you who are gonna visit there, um, has an amazing museum. So it has a Tel Aviv museum that everyone has heard of, but also has the CCA. The CCA, the Center for Contemporary Art, is tucked behind Shuka Carmel, uh, the Carmel Market in Tel Aviv. And it is one of the most interesting, most cutting edge museums of contemporary art in the world. Um, they're amazing, they're tiny, but they put together beautiful shows. And Nasser had a solo show there a few years ago. And here we see the, some of the work that he created for that show. So to make that show, he didn't make artworks, he didn't make embroideries, he barely made anything himself for this work. Instead, he commissioned a whole home to be made inside the gallery. And what I mean when I say a whole home is he commissioned artisans, artists, designers, makers of all walks of life, both within Israel and within Palestine to create furniture, wall hangings, dishes um, that he would fill an imaginary home with. So we're gonna look at these from a little bit closer up, but I just wanted you to see. So the artist made almost nothing in this room. He went and picked out, um, had people design according to his specifications or he bought ready-made, uh, all kinds of crafts and arts that you can find in that region. So for example, here's a section of the kitchen uh, at the gallery, they couldn't show the whole CCA exhibition, so they, they picked kind of pieces of it. This is the, um, the kitchen, and when we get closer, you'll see it's full of ceramics. There's even a plate there that was made especially for his exhibition at the CCA. But we see Armenian ceramics, we, th we see hand-blown uh, glasswork from Jaffa and Jerusalem not all created by necessarily Palestinians or Jews. There's Druze artwork here. There's Armenian, like I said, um, just all the kinds of arts and crafts that you can find in that area. A lot of it is green because the artist's favorite color is green. It very much does not look like a design magazine kind of home. Uh, but definitely like a collection of handmade things and things that are a little older. This is the living room. And what he said, basically, he said, I made my dream home. I, I got to design my dream house, which in a way I think is also kind of a very American perspective a perspective that has to do with kind of creating a fantasy, creating um, a, a space that you can um, pick things out and buy things and create your dream, create your reality. Look at this beautiful um, coffee table he had. I have a detail of this coffee table that he had made. This is the center, some really exquisitely made things. Now the two kind of hints uh, in the gallery to um, here, 
to the identity of their creator is uh, these two windows that you're seeing from uh, far away now. Um, so the two windows are actually backlit photographs. So they're not actually windows. One of them, the one on the right, is um, a seascape uh, that the artist took, took this picture in Jaffa. And then he mounted the picture on a light box and had those um, uh, metalwork uh, grates created especially for it and the, and the curtain and everything. And the other window, I have a picture, I think, yeah, I think I only have this far away image. The gallery did not have a close up image of the other window, but we can, we can kind of get close to it. You can see enough to see that the other window is one of those kinds of rolling hills, like what we saw in his embroideries. And this was shot in Palestine. He does not give a specific um, uh, location. And so what basically he did is he created a room that has one window to Palestine and one window to Israel. So again, this kind of both a, an impossible space, but also actually the space that the artist himself lives in, in a way, between Israel and Palestine and the US. So this is the other part of his, um, of his exhibition uh, at James Cohen Gallery. And it ends with this uh, wall of Khamsa uh, sculptures. So this is our uh, gallery tour for today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of the artists. Wayne, if you see any um, interesting questions in the chat or if you had any questions you wanted to raise. Absolutely, to absolutely. Yeah. We, you've shown us, wow, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit uh, intimidated by where do we begin with the amount of material that you showed. So let me just make sure we try to get in at least one question for each of the artists and then I'll come back um, if, if there's more time. There was an interesting set of uh, uh, comments about uh, Elizabeth Clay's work. Um, people uh, said some of it looked like printmaking and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Helen pointed out that it actually looked like a theater set. That's and true. asked whether any of the works given uh, the scale um, actually have been used for for theater designs. Not that I not that I know of, um, but I also felt that very much being in the space that it felt like a theatrical set. It felt like like a play. Absolutely, I think sh someone should collaborate with her to do um, to do theater design. I may absolutely. I may volunteer. Yes, okay. you should. So let's talk about uh, uh, Saul's work a, a little bit more. So. Um, uh, I'm going to try to get a couple questions in here. Um, the, there, uh, people were very, um, I think, taken by the idea of the permanent versus temporary art. And yeah. when you showed them, where, where you, you, you said it's actually painted over, and did this, he leave yeah. any instructions on that part of this? Or it's just... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was... It was to be painted over always in his lifetime and later. Um, people are not allowed to cut out walls and buy them. If you are a private collector and you have a solo wit in your home and you move, you notify the studio and they come and they paint over your old wall and they'll come and paint it again in your new home. Um, it's He was very, very particular about that. Very that's, clear. That's what I figured. Yeah. Um, Michael asked, and I'm going to ask one more question where, where, because his work is, um, you know, the, this methodology of sort of casting instructions into the future for other people, you know, to, to follow. Um, and then we saw from your video what that looked like with, you know, this group of students at Williams and, and yeah. uh, the elaborate uh, attention to to very specific uh, details to to then create those those huge murals that 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 are are, are just so uh, uh, wonderful to look at. Um, Michael asked the question: What motivates artists, students, etc., 
to take on another artist's vision and work like right. that. Um, you know, because that's yeah. a different kind of motivational um, uh, issue that's raised by his work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the people who work in his studio, that's their job. That's their money job. A lot of them are artists and make their own art. And when they go to their own studio, they do their own thing. And their job that they get paid for, or in, in the William students um, uh, case, it was, uh, they all took this as part of their art classes as credits, is to experience um, how somebody else works. Now, this is not new to Soloit or to the 70s, you know. The Sistine Chapel was mostly painted by apprentices and the master would come and paint the hands and the faces. Um, and then there were people whose job it was to just paint drapes all day long or paint clouds all day long and whatever the master was working on. So the art world has always had a, an element of, um, you know, kind of like when you make a movie, you have the director who has the vision and then he has his photographer and his makeup person and his actors and his script writers and all these people who make the director's vision come true. The, the art world has always had this aspect. Solowit kind of took it to the next level by saying, I'm not gonna participate in any of this because I, the, I, I want the, the part that I contribute as an artist to be the idea. And it is going to purely go from my instructions into someone else's hands and anyone's hands can do it because it's not about the hand, it's about the concept. Interesting. Um, so on Jordan, we would probably need an entire episode to um, unpack the, the, the question that, uh, uh, that we got from Karen, but, I, but maybe there's a way to bring it together um, in, in a more simple way. She's yeah. asking, and, and what, what you identified in his work, that there is both a political and a personal motivation that are distinct, can be seen, Right. in the work in different ways and in different nuanced ways um what karen asked is about what is it about his work that offers some kind of vision or um i don't know hope for how palestinians and israelis might be able to live together i don't know i don't know if it does honestly i don't think that he is um offering necessarily a roadmap or a plan or an idea. I think all he's doing is reflecting his personal experience. And he is a person who is enacting, you know, peace in the Middle East in his own life, right? Like he is both a Palestinian, both an American, and now a father to a son who is at least half Jewish um, and is married to a Jewish Israeli man. So um, I don't think that he's necessarily creating some sort of roadmap that other people can follow, but I think he's describing a reality that is complex. And anyone who's lived in that region or who has visited that region or who has read an article about that region knows that it's, um, it's an extremely complicated situation. And it seems like maybe the only thing you could extract from Nassar's work is that the only way forward is compassion and seeing other people as human uh, from both sides and appreciating the beauty and the humanity on both sides and protecting that uh, beauty and humanity. Well, that, um, is, that, that in my mind is a beautiful interpretation of, of his work and the idea that um, our, our friends and viewers can actually see his work in Tel Aviv at C CCA and mm -hmm. explore it on their own itself is a tribute to what you say, absolutely. Um, you know, if, if if artistry can't be about complexity, um, that that seems like it would be a grayer, duller world. Uh, the world has uh, complexity to explore. And uh, Gabrielle, so grateful uh, to you for bringing it to us in again in such a um, a, a, a really clear and. Um, objective way uh, each week that each time we have one of these episodes, we meet very, very different artists, different backgrounds, different identities, different aspects of uh, the, the um, medium that they work with. And, and um, I hope everybody, if you haven't seen all the, uh, the shows we've done in our series with Gabriella, please go back 
We offer our, our all of our archives uh, for free. Um, we do ask that you know now and then you shed it, you know give a little love to us uh, if you can with a little donation to the American Israel Friendship League so that we can continue to provide all this for free. But it is um, we have all these wonderful episodes you can find on the website. Uh, take a look at it under E A I F L. Uh, take a look at some of the other artists we explored and come back when we visit with Gabrielle again uh, later in the summer for another episode. But you don't have to wait uh, that long for art in Israel because next week, literally this coming Sunday, we have another episode with a program called the Jerusalem International Fellows, which brings artists from other parts of the world, from India, from Mexico, from elsewhere to Jerusalem to create art and then to share it. And so it's sort of, um, we have a, a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. We hope you'll join us for it this coming Sunday, the 28th. Yes, it's a two for a week of art here at AIFL. Um, and we hope you will appreciate it as much as you appreciate this episode. Everybody come on back, have a great summer uh, and enjoy it with uh, these wonderful creative um, offerings that we have for you here. Thanks for having me, Wayne. Bye, Gabriel. See you next time. Great.